Hello citizens and welcome back. In today's video I want to do a deep dive on the replication layer, server meshing and everything in between. As always, if you like this video, sacrifice a like and a comment to the YouTube algorithm and subscribe for more. And here's a shout out to our amazing patrons for their support of the channel and the armory. I understand that I have a lot of viewers who are newer to Star Citizen and might just now be catching up on the server meshing talk and the related tests. But also some who may not know what server meshing is, why is it such a big goal and just how long this whole journey has been going on. And in this video I would like to walk you through the most important parts and terminology. First, I think it's important to talk about why we need server meshing in the first place. As you may know already, the end goal for Star Citizen is to have one massive server with all the planets, all the locations and all players in one. There is one major problem with this. Star Citizen is massive, both in terms of scale of the universe and the number of players. This is obviously way too much work for one single server to perform. However, we can connect multiple simulation servers and make them cooperate. This is what CIG calls a server mesh. However, it's not as easy as I just made it sound. There are many steps that need to be taken and many features that need to be implemented first. And that's what this video is about. I am going to take you step by step on the journey from the current state where we're limited by the playable area size and the player count all the way to the single instance universe. This video is going to be pretty long because there is a lot to cover and I would like to try this longer format for all my future videos, so let me know what you think about it. Let's start with what was at the time the first major step to server meshing, and that is Object Container Streaming or OCS for short. But what does that mean? Well, every object or ship or anything you can physically see in Star Citizen has to be represented on the client, which is your computer, and on the server which manages the state and contents of its given instance. And as you traverse the physical locations of the verse, whatever you are seeing has to stream in from the server to your client, and whatever changes you make have to be streamed to the server. At the same time, the server has no reason to actively keep track of places with no players so those can be streamed out to the persistent storage. And when someone visits that location, it can be streamed from persistent storage to the server and then to that player. As you can clearly see, there is a lot of work going on to achieve this. That's why Star Citizen objects are organized into object containers. These allow the developers to create graphs of objects which can be manipulated as one large object. The interesting part of this is that object containers can be as small or as big as the developers need. And more importantly, they can be nested. Meaning that one object container can contain others and itself can be contained in another object container. Let me explain with an example. Let's say that you have two rooms that are connected by a door. Each of these rooms and whatever they contain is an object container. So we have two object containers. When you enter one of the rooms and close the door behind you, the other room no longer needs to exist. So it can be streamed out, saving whatever is inside and only the room you are in is actively managed by your client and the server. For simplification, this example ignores any possible caching but you get the idea. Let's expand this example to Stanton. The entire Stanton system is one massive object container. However, the individual planets and other points of interest around Stanton are also object containers that are part of the Stanton container. And each location within those planets is also an object container. And so on down to individual rooms in some cases. This structure makes network management a lot easier. At least in terms of streaming content in and out. And it also gives a hint to the next step, which is persistent storage. The big selling point of Star Citizen is that the changes you make to the world are persistent, meaning that they are present there for a long time. So if you were to leave something on some random planet and then came back a few months later, it might still be there. Now, in software engineering, there are a lot of ways to store and retrieve data. But Star Citizen has a lot of details and very complex structures that it has to manage. Just think of your ship and try to count how many individual parts it has. And now think about how you have to store a lot of information about the state of each of those parts. This is quite a complex set of information which can be changed at any moment. And since it serves a real time game universe it also has to perform very well. Fortunately we have a structure that actually supports this. And that is graphs. Now I don't mean graphs as in bar or line graphs, I mean the mathematical graphs with nodes and edges. 
So now we can take the nested structure of object containers and everything they contain and convert that to a graph. Each object container or object becomes a node that carries the properties of that object. And then the nodes are connected by edges which define their relationship. And then we can navigate the nodes and the edges all the way from the top, which would be the universe object container, all the way down to properties of individual items. The cool thing is that you can move parts of a graph around simply by moving the topmost node of the object you want to move from one place to another. And this also means that you can load and unload separate parts as needed as well. This is the process CAG calls stowing and unstowing. And now to build out this persistent storage that can manage both the relationships of objects and their properties and state, CAG have developed an entirely new structure and database that they call the Entity Graph. The Entity Graph is just a very fancy database that can store all of this data in one place as well as manipulate the hierarchy of the nodes. This is the culmination of all previous persistent storage technologies, starting with the legacy database to the persistent database and then iCache. There are a few caveats with the current entity graph, however. First of all, I believe that there are currently two or more instances of it. One is permanent and serves as the long-term storage of all objects and the player-owned items. And another that exists while a given server instance is active. The server entity graph is created from the permanent one and persists all the physical changes made on the given server. While permanent changes like players making and spending money or buying gear and ships are then persisted to the permanent entity graph. I believe that the end goal is for these two to eventually become one. When you combine this persistent graph and object container streaming, you get persistent entity streaming, which was another major milestone. Now, while this is quite an elegant solution for storage, it creates some problems with loading and unloading content more specifically with managing this process. Why is that, you ask? Well, let's take a look at what happens when an asset, which could be an item or a player or a whole object container, is streamed in from the persistent database. First, it has to be streamed into the server that has authority over it. We will get to authority in a minute. Then it has to be replicated to any other servers in the mesh that need to be aware of that asset. And then finally, it has to be replicated to every game client that interacts with it. And at the same time, any change that happens to an asset while it's streamed in has to be replicated across all servers and clients and the persistent database. As you might have guessed, this is where the replication layer comes in. Essentially, all the replication layer does is it provides an easy way to facilitate this network logic. It also concentrates all this logic into a separate service. This is very important for two reasons. First of all, it allows us to scale the replication layer depending on how much traffic is coming through it. Second, it makes the system a lot more resilient. Because if an error happens in the replication layer, it might only crash that service instead of bringing down everything. And now I think it's a good time to explain shards. As far as we know, a shard is a group of services that together form the persistent database, the game server, the replication layer, and everything else needed to create an instance of Star Citizen. Currently, shards mostly contain one game server and then the related services. But the plan for the future is to replace the single game server with a mesh of game servers working together. But before we get into server meshing, we need to address one more issue. If you only have one server dedicated to simulating and managing the state of every asset that is streamed in, this is very simple and very clean but it becomes very problematic once you start using multiple servers. Let's say that you have multiple servers operating in a mesh, and then you have an asset that's being simulated by this server mesh. All servers need to have the asset streamed in and so do all the clients. However, you can't have every server try to simulate the asset and manage its state. This would cause countless issues, so you have to implement a system to decide which server is responsible for simulating which assets. And at the same time, you have to implement the ability to transfer this responsibility between servers. And this is where authority comes in. A given server in the mesh has authority over all assets that are in a certain area or that meet certain conditions. Every other server is merely tracking this asset, meaning that it's aware of its existence but can't change its state. CAG referred to this as having a client view of the asset. However, some assets such as players, ships, or bullets can move around. 
And it could happen that they move out of the area administered by the initial server. And that's why we also need the ability to transfer authority from one server to another. CIG have actually managed to build this so well that the transfer is completely seamless for the player. Arguably, this is the most important step on the road to server meshing. And now we finally have all the pieces in place. At the time of writing, CIG are testing the replication layer quite extensively. This is the final step before proper server meshing. So what is that going to look like? Well, the first step is static server meshing. This means that the shard will have a set number of servers working together to create a server mesh. This step is very important as it will allow CIG to stress test the replication layer and authority transfer. It also gives CIG the time and the testing grounds for developing resource allocation rules. What I mean by resource allocation rules is the logic that will decide how will the servers in the mesh split the work. Of course, CIG could just assign specific areas of the universe to specific servers, but that's not very effective. For example, let's say that every planet in Stanton gets its own server. If there are no players present around one of the planets, the server is doing nothing and those server resources are wasted. So it makes a lot more sense for the servers to split the work as needed. This would provide a significant performance improvement, especially for situations where players are concentrated in one area. For example, the fleet parade during Invictus launch week. In theory, it would be possible for one server to be fully dedicated to simulating the parade area and everything going on there while the other servers handle the rest of the universe. However, this is still not quite optimal. Figuring out how many servers you need for each instance of the game is difficult. And at the same time, having a fixed number of servers per instance is very expensive in terms of resources. And it might end up being too much or too little. This is where dynamic server meshing comes in. What dynamic server meshing is trying to achieve is to have the ability to assign or remove simulation servers from a shard as needed. Meaning that if a very few players are logged into a given shard, that shard can remove all but one of the servers and save some resources. At the same time, if a shard is completely full, players are spread out, and everyone is spawning large ships, more servers can be added to keep up performance. But more importantly, it allows CIG to increase the size of the universe that can be accessed in one shard, as well as increase the player count until eventually the entire game is one shard with everything and everyone in it. Also, why are we talking about saving resources? Well, simply put, servers are expensive. CAG utilizes cloud computing for their server needs. This allows them a lot of flexibility on how many various servers they have without them actually having to physically maintain them. The problem is that cloud is expensive, and in many cases it's built based on the time it's used. So it's very important for CIG to only be using as much resources as they need and not a server more. And on that note, shout out to the channel and Armory sponsor Verotech who provide reliable and reasonably priced cloud services. Link is in the description. It is difficult to say how long this is going to take, but there is some hope that static server meshing will be available this year. And from there things can only speed up, especially now that a lot of content is being transferred over from Squadron 42 and many developers are being moved to work on the Persistent Universe. And with that being said, that's all for today. What do you think? Can CIG get server meshing done in the next two years? What are your concerns about server meshing? Let me know in the comments and also let me know if you like this longer format. Thank you for watching, fly safe and I will see you in the verse.